Uh, hi, hello, my study buddy. So, what's up? Um, by the way, I have a concern because this past few days, I felt so confused regarding the posts that I have read on social media, like Facebook, Twitter, and even on Instagram. Because, you know, I cannot understand what they are talking about and even their own opinion. It is just because the words and the terms that they are using are not very clear. Or should I say, those are very ambiguous and vague. So can you please enlighten me on how should I handle all of those? Well, hi there, Ryan. How convenient. Not the part about you having a problem, but the part about you having a convenient problem. You see, I was just reading the modules from Acuna's book, Philosophical Analysis, wherein in some of the modules, ambiguity and vagueness was very well discussed. And don't you worry, since now that we're both here, let's go tackle it. Oh, sure. What a great idea. So, Ali Dare, what are you waiting for? Come on and let's discuss it. And now, I am inviting you all to open your book on page 45 from Acuna Book, Unit Number 1. Hi. So before everything else, allow us to introduce ourselves. I am Jody Richie Torres, a student of Applied Psychology program belonging to Block AP1A. I am Rowan Ahalosores, Bachelor of Arts in Applied Psychology student from Block A. Guided by the supervision of Professor Ian Kalika, all the way from University of the Philippines Diliman Extension Program in Pampanga. And here is our group report under the philosophy class. Classroom may batas. Bawal lumabas o bawal lumabas. Pero pag sinabing pag nag-comply ka na bawal lumabas, Pero may, sina may ginawa ka sa pinagbabawal nila, inayos mo yung law ng classroom nyo at sinabmit mo ulit, ay pwede na pala ikaw ang lumabas. So, Why is boxing called an industry, Mr. President, in this bill? Industry. Can you repeat the question, Mr. President? Why is boxing called an industry under this bill? It's a livelihood, Mr. President, uh, for uh, so many people. It is a livelihood. All right. But it is also a sport. Yes, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, there, and uh, it, the preference of the of the sponsor is to call it an industry. Just, just for. That's for the record. Hi. Again, I'm Jody Richie Torres. I'm here to help discuss the fifth module of Acuna's book, Philosophical Analysis. And first, let's talk about the objectives. After finishing this module, I guarantee that you should be able to differentiate between an ambiguous from a vague term, recognize the ambiguity of an evaluative term, and avoid the fallacy of equivocation. If I say to you, I saw her duck, do you think I'm talking about seeing her perform a certain action? Or am I talking about a water animal that quacks a lot? Or perhaps an amphibious transport vehicle? A strong linen? A type of mollusk? Or do you think I caused her duck harm like I literally, literally sawed her duck like Nilagariko or something? As we can observe, duck is subject to different interpretations. And if we're unaware about the language game in which we're using the term duck, it would cause confusion or misunderstanding. Duck, after all, is an example of an ambiguous word. In last week's discussion, we learned that when a term acquires numerous uses or different uses in different language games, wherein it uh, acquires different interpretations as well, the, the term has become ambiguous. Ambiguity, according to Acuna, is a matter of degree, and the more uses a term acquires, the more ambiguous it becomes. Let's take a look, for example, at the evaluative term, good. But first, what, are, what is an evaluative term? So an evaluative term is a term that is used to express approval or disapproval, like good, bad, excellent, and so on and so forth. Good without an argument is a is a very ambiguous evaluative term. 
if I ask you now what is good? The answer, of course, would depend on what language game we are in or we are using. For a hedonist, a term good is used to refer to bodily pleasure. That means that any action that will promote pleasure is good, like eating or dancing or even the process of reproduction, which I suppose you all know about. For a humanist, on the other hand, the term good will refer to the development of your human potentials. Any action that will hasten the development of your intellectual potential, for example, is good, like reading, active participation in discourse communities, and etc. Meanwhile, a utilitarian will use any action that promotes the greatest happiness to the greatest number as good, or in short, the greater good. However, if you are a logical positivist, you would use the term good to express your approval of an act. Alternatively, if you're a Kantian, an action is good if it is done in accordance to your duty. These are examples on how we can sort out the ambiguity of the term good in philosophy. But what about we try to define it in the context of everyday usage? Almost anything can be described as good. And if I ask you to de define the term for me, it would be difficult unless you use it as a modifier. For example, a good man, a good book, and a good dog. Even then, these concepts are still ambiguous. After all, what makes a good man and a good book or a good dog? Now, if there are ambiguous terms, we also have vague ones. We, we now have the idea that vague terms refer to terms whose meaning has become so loose in different language games. Now, let, let's explore it even further. When a term is vague, this means that something went wrong with the intention of the concept. The set of traits that members must have to be included in the extension is not sufficient to determine what to include and what to exclude. For example, the term sum in symbolic logic would mean at least one but not all. How many then is sum? If I say some philosophy students felt bored during my discussion, how many students am I exactly pointing about? And which students? Which students are included? Other examples of vague terms that leave you wondering how many items are being talked about include some, many, a few, and almost all. The terms tall, short, and sufficient are also vague terms. Most of the time though, you could counter vagueness by clarifying the intention of your concept to make it usable for including members and excluding non-members. Let's observe the following examples. If I'm going out and I say, I'll be back soon, do you, do you have a concrete idea how soon is soon? After all, the term can mean a minute, an hour, a couple of hours, or for some, even a day. So that is confusing. You can see how different and much better it would be if I just say, I'll be back in an hour. This is because the term soon is vague. Likewise, instead of just saying only tall players are allowed to play, you could say only tall players or those players whose height is higher than 1.8 meters can participate. Here, we've modified our sentence to include the phrase that clarifies the intention of the term tall. Sometimes though, the term is just too vague to give an example of. This is because vagueness is a matter of degree as well. Vague terms like obscenity or pornography are difficult to pin down. A naked picture in a magazine is pornography, yet a painted picture of someone naked is art. So you see how that is? Vague terms can also be described as terms that lack preciseness of meaning. Let's review, for example, kimchi statements on the closing of the ABS-CBN franchise. So, I, I suppose you can remember that she went viral for this. Sa classroom may batas, bawal lumabas o bawal lumabas. Pero pag sinabi, pag nag-comply ka na bawal lumabas, pero may ginawa ka sa pinagbabawal nila, inayos mo yung law ng classroom nyo at sinabit mo ulit, ay, pwede na pala ikaw lumabas. So, the reason she went viral for this is not because uh, she reached the people. It, it's because she was vague about it or... For some, she didn't make any sense at all. So let's try to dissect it. Pero pag sinabi, first of all, what is sinabi? Ano yung mga sinabi? So here, she didn't bother explaining this part. Therefore, we don't know what the sayings include. So sinabi in English, we could translate it uh, into what has been said. So the context would be the same. So what has been said? If I'm going to say, let's follow what has been said, and I didn't 
explain to you what has been said. How would you know what are the rules or the laws that are included in what has been said? So as you can see, just saying na pero pag sinabi doesn't give you an idea kung ano yung sinabi. Here, she is being, being vague. Also, in this part, she said na inayos mo yung law ng classroom nyo at sinabmit mo ulit. Is she talking about the law? Submitting the law again? Because for me, that doesn't make any sense. Perhaps she was trying to say something else but somehow, she has been very vague about it and therefore, there is no understanding between me who's a listener and her who speaks about it. This is why it is essential that we avoid ambiguity and vagueness. But of course, as we're, we should all be aware of, some use ambiguity and vagueness intentionally. In fact, we have what we call the fallacy of equivocation. The fallacy of equivocation refers to using a term in one way and later using it again in another way in the same line of reasoning. Let's look at this example from John Paul Sartre. So this is a quotation. Consciousness is a being such that in its being, its being is in question insofar as this being implies a being other than itself. So how many uses did, did being exactly have in that? So one is left wondering. And since the int intention of this term cannot be penned down, the term is also vague. Oh, another example. Naalala niyo ba yung interaction ni Pacquiao at Lillian sa Senado? Pacquiao referred to boxing in multiple ways including boxing as an industry, as a medium of getting income, as a business, and as sports. This makes bo boxing an ambiguous term. And by the way, he moves from the different definitions to advance his Argument is an example of fallacy of equivocation. Confusing, isn't it? So most of the difficulty and confusion that emanates from the use of terms can be traced to either ambiguity or vagueness. And note that there is only one antidote to either an ambiguous or vague term or concept. That is to define them. In line with that, let us now hear from Sorry. Welcome! Welcome to module number 6, which is entitled On Definition. For its introduction, in this module, you will deploy all the skills, concepts, and principles that you have learned from the first modules, like modules number 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, in order for you to develop your ability to define any term. This ability is one of the indispensable skills of a critical thinker. Once you have learned these skills, ha! Huh, I guarantee, I guarantee you that it would be beneficial to you to the rest of your life. Now let's go for its objectives. After completing this module, I know that you will be able to First, distinguish the different types of definition. Second, discuss the importance as well as the limitation of each type of definition. Third, state the importance of intention and extension in order to have complete understanding of the meaning of any term. And last, and of course, definitely not the least, fourth, explain the technique of operational definition. And now, let's start it with definition by synonym. I know, I know that you are most familiar with defining a term by the use of a synonym. Am I right? I think I'm I right. If anybody asks you the meaning of the term argument, belief, or alien, you search your memory for an equivalent term, a synonym. You may be predisposed to say an argument means quarrel, a belief means faith, an alien means foreigner, meaning you define an unfamiliar term by using a familiar term. But looking for a synonym is just a preparation for composing a good definition. Apparently, for conversational purposes, a synonym will do. Although, you must admit that this technique is the most rudimentary type of definition if it could be called that. When we say rudimentary, it means it has a limited knowledge only. In the first place, definition by synonym is an error in definition called circular definition. This means that you have defined a term by using the same term or by its synonym. Remember, 
anyone who requests for any definitions of a term doesn't know its meaning or how to use it. Supposing somebody asks you for the meaning of the term amphibian, can you define the term by using a synonym? This appears to be a bit difficult, so we will try the another method. At this part, the ostensive definitions will enter in this discussion. On many occasions, the use of the word of a term can easily be specified by giving examples of the members of the extension, either verbally or by a pointing gesture. You can say that the term amphibian denotes animal like frogs and salamanders. Normally, giving examples of the extensions of a term would satisfy the curiosity of the person who does not know the meaning of the term amphibian. This type of definition is called ostensive definition. This is the most common way of conveying the use of a term, namely pointing to the members of its extension. In fact, you learn how to use most of the basic vocabulary of your native language through ostensive definition. Please note that the concept learned through ostensive definition is incomplete. Yes, incomplete. Since the use of the term amphibians will be limited to the animals pointed at only to frogs and salamanders. In short, your understanding of the use of the term amphibian will be narrowly limited to frogs and salamanders only. And all the rest of the animals will not be amphibian including those which are. You can discriminate frogs and salamanders from the rest of the animal kingdom. But, but you cannot generalize the use of the term to other animals that truly belong to the extension of the concept amphibian. Furthermore, you must know that the extension of most concepts cannot be pointed to. For example, the members of the extension of analytic, fictitious, metaphysical, dispositional, and theoretical concepts cannot be pointed to. And now, let's discuss the intention and extension. Please remember that to have complete understanding of the meaning of the concept is to have to state its intention without vagueness and give some typical examples of the members of the extension. For instance, um, in the case of the concept amphibian again, the intention of the concept is animals that can live in both land and water are amphibians. Knowing the intention, you can now generalize to the other members of the extension like crocodiles, salamanders, anaconda, congo eel, mokasin, and etc. It seems that to have full understanding and control of the use of a term, you must be able to state in simple, clear, and precise language the intention of the concept. Always remember that, in a simple, clear, and precise language. In this way, you would avoid vagueness. You would avoid vagueness. Next, you must offer some typical examples of the members of the extension in order to complete the understanding of them. In this way, it would facilitate the learning of the concept through the psychological process of discrimination and generalization. Whatever else definition may include this is the bottom line. At this point, you might be predisposed to ask the question, how do you define the term definition? This is real simple. So with, okay, a definition is a linguistic device that provides an explanation or demonstration about the use of a term. The use of a term is highlighted in terms of its intention and extension in the concept of a language scheme. All definition must share this common feature. A definition is complete if you are provided with a clear statement. If you are provided with a clear statement of the intention and some typical members of its extension. And now, to report the continuous terms and categories under on definitions, I call my partner, Jody Richie Torres. In defining concepts, there is also a technique called reportive definition. From the root word report, we are providing information about how a term is being used in the same way in numerous language games. In other words, this type of definition is a report on the existing meaning of the word. In reportive definition, 
either the standard or the conventional use of the term is used. The conventional use consists of how the term is used by actual people in numerous real-life situations, which makes sure that the meaning of the term is alive. It is being used or, in other words, it has the form of life. Reportive definition is comparable to lexical definition. Lexical definition specifies the meaning of an expression by stating it in terms of other expressions whose meaning is assumed to be known. For example, a U is a female ship while a RAM is a male ship. College dictionaries or desk dictionaries usually make use of reportive definition. For example, Oxford Languages Dictionary ref refers to prime numbers as a number that can be divided exactly only by itself and one. So while a reportive definition is used to report the current usage of the term, a stipulative definition on the other hand assigns a new meaning to a term. A stipulative definition proposes to use a term in a very unique way in a language game, whether or not the term already has meaning. When you make use of stipulative definitions, there are a few things you should be aware of. Number one, a stipulative definition def departs from conventional use. You are proposing to use a term in a specified way to suit your purpose. Research, for example. You are conducting a research about the perspective of lazy students. The term lazy is vague. The, the term lazy students is also vague. Since there are no criteria on which students will qualify as lazy and which students will qualify as not lazy, you are now going to assign a new meaning to the term lazy student, which could be a student who procrastinates in more than 75% of his or her assignments, which he or she has been given sufficient time to complete. I know this, Uranus, but I suppose you got the point. Also, those who wish to read your research or cite it will have to agree to your definition. Therefore, it is your duty to orient them about your stipulative definition. This is why when we write research papers, we include a definition of terms. According to Wittgenstein, we can circumscribe the use of a term for many specialized purposes, which include scientific research, or coining a new term in philosophy, naming an invention, and etc. In fact, a stipulative definition is the main technique used for introducing certain technical terms such as simple object, ideas, sense data, a priori, mind, and corporeal substance. Other examples include poor and excellent, and even psychoanalytic terms such as Freud's ID, ego, and superego. There are times, however, when concepts do not exhibit directly observable characteristic of their intention, times when certain operations must first be performed. Relevant to this, there is a technique in defining concepts, a technique which is invented by Percy William Bridgman. It is called operational definitions. Bridgman specified two types of operations. First is the instrumental operations. Instrumental operations are performable with the use of different devices for observations such as microscope or a telescope. The second type of operation involves pen and paper operation, verbal operations, and thought experiment. A typical operational definition of the term magnetic is as follows. An object is magnetic if and only if you actually perform the following operation. You put iron filings near the object and you observe that the iron filings cling and attach to the object. For another example, IQ makes sense only if operationally defined. The operational definition of this term consists in taking a pen and paper test like the, like the Binet IQ test. The formula used is mental age over chronological age times 100. So by performing a, an operation, a paper and pen operation, we are able to define IQ. We are able to know what a person's IQ is. With operational definitions, it is important to note the following. The operation you have to perform is actually the intention of the concept because it is a necessary and sufficient condition for the membership and the extension of the concept. It does not cease to be the intention of the concept just because the traits are observ observable only by performing some operations. In fact, it becomes in a strict intention because you have to perform the operation to know if the object is part of the extension. Welcome back! And now we are here in module number 7 entitled Analytic Definition. For its introduction, 
Hmm, this module is focused on one type of definition. I chose to call it analytic definition. This technique is the culmination of many concepts and principles that you have learned in the past modules. That is why I know this technique is easy for you to learn, to remember, and of course, to apply. You can use it to define almost all the types of concepts that you will encounter. The only possible exception is dispositional concepts in the sciences which make use of operational definition. As you apply the technique, you get better and better! It would be very intellectually rewarding because you will have great direct confidence that you have not only to complete your understanding but also to complete control of the concept that you are using. I'm sure that this technique of analytic definition will be beneficial to you to the rest of your natural life. Now, let's discuss its objectives. After completing this module, I am sure you will be able to Number 1. Differentiate the definiendum, definient, and penotata. Number 2. Avoid common errors in definition. Number 3. Apply the 5 rules of a good definition. And of course, the last, number 4, to compose good analytic definition. Hmm... Huh. Let me begin this module with a question that I know is at the back of your mind after your encounter with module number 6. Question. Can we have an easy to apply and a practical technique of a defining a term? The answer is yes! Yes, we can! A practical way of a defining a concept is my modified version of a logical definition. I propose to call my technique as analytic definition. You know that the stipulative definitions are objectionable. Only when reported definition would be more appropriate. But when you are introducing a new technique without a name, you have a right to give it a name. I did just that. And now, let's discuss and study the analytic definition. Hmm, this is how I propose to use the method of analytic definition. So, analytic definition is focused on the statement of the intention without vagueness and the offering of typical examples of the extension. Unlike the traditional version of logical definition that makes use of only two categories, namely definindum and definient, my proposal is to make use of three categories, which are definindum, definient, and Denotata. Let me qualify these terms. The term to be defined is called definindo. Once again, definindo. So, if you are defining the term mamal, this is your definindo. Once again, the mamal is your definindo. The definient, again, the definient provides the intention of the defining property of the definindo. So, in this case, the defining property of mammals. And of course, the denotata. Denotata provides the samples of the members of extensions of the definindo. Denotata is the most neglected aspect of almost all types of definition found in the literature of logic and philosophy of language. But now, we are emphasizing this neglected aspect in the model of analytic definition. In addition, the definions usually consist of two parts, the genus and the differentia. The genus is the wider concept of which the definindum is a member. When a concept admits of members that are themselves concepts, the wider concept is called genus, and the member concepts are called species. So, aside from the definindum, there are other species that are members of the genus. Thus, there is a need to distinguish the definindum from the other species. This is the job of the differentia. It states the trait or the set of traits, characteristics, or even the functions that distinguishes the definindum from the other species of the genus. A good example that I know that you are familiar with is the term triangle. Uh-huh, the triangle. It is a genus that has two species as members, namely the equilateral and non-equilateral triangles. Now, 
there is obviously a need to distinguish the two species that can be done through the differentia of equilateral triangles, namely the property of having all sides equal. To recap the point, let me give you another good example, the concept mammal. Once again, the concept of mammal. It has 4,000 species as members. The necessary and sufficient condition for membership is the possession of a single essential property called mammary glands. These species are subdivided into three main genuses, namely monotremes, marsupials, and placentals. How do we differentiate one from the other? Well, monotremes are the only egg-laying mammals. Well-known denotata are the platypus and the speedy antiether. On the other hand, marsupials are mammals that carry their young in their abdominal pouches. For each denotata are the kangaroo, koala, and the possum. And of course, dog, cat, monkey, apes, and including men are the members of the placental genus. So the differential of this species is having embryos nourished in the womb through an internal placenta. And now, ask yourself, do you have a complete understanding of the concept mama? Obviously, yes, you have! Finally! <laughs> so, let us begin again with a simpler example of the analytic definition of the concept bird. So as you can see in the picture of my slide, our definition doom is the bird. And for its definition, it is divided into two, the genus and the differentia. For its genus, it is an animal. And of course, for its differentia, a bird has a feathers. And for its genotapa or examples, those are the ostrich, chicken, pelican, and etc. So meaning, all animals with feathers are birds. This is the trait essential to all birds. Logicians would call this trait as necessary and sufficient condition for membership in the extension. If an animal has feather, it is automatically a bird. But if the animal did not have a feather, automatically that is not a bird. So now, let's elaborate the analytic definition more. So when we say um, analytic definitions, it would tremendously facilitate the technique of stating the intentions of many concepts without vagueness and readily provide some examples of the members of their extension. Consider some samples of analytic definitions is in their slides. So epistemology. Epistemology is a sub-discipline of philosophy dealing with the source, nature, and validity of knowledge. Empiricism and rationalism are the two types of epistemologies. Now let's criticize it. So in this analytic definition, you have the definition, which is the epistemology. The definition includes the genus, which is the sub-discipline of philosophy, and of course, the differentia, which is refers to the source, nature, and validity of knowledge. And for its denotata, we have the rationalism and empiricism. So these are the samples of the extension of the concept.
Now, let's study and discuss the common errors in definition. There are many things that could go wrong in composing a definition. There must be remembered in order to discharge your obligation as a critical thinker in criticizing a definition. So let us consider the most common errors and how to avoid them. So let us go back to our example of the concept word. Suppose it is defined in the following way. So as you can see, we have a picture in our slide that is refers to the analytic definitions of a bird. So in the definition, a bird, a bird, a bird. In definitions, we have the genus and differentia. For the genus, all of those says that a bird is an animal. That is correct. And then for its differentia, uh, a bird is an animal that flies, that lays eggs, that sings and talks. Correct. But when it comes in denotata, we are not sure if those are still correct. So let's criticize it. The differentia that flies will include bats, which are not birds but mammals. It would even include butterflies and moths. The definition, therefore, is too broad and will include non-members of the concept. The differentia that lays eggs will include platypus, turtles, and crocodiles. The definition is still broad. The differentia that flies and that lay egg does not discriminate fully the birds from the rest of the animal kingdom. In contrast, the differentia that sings, talks, is too narrow and will exclude animals that cannot sing nor talk but are genuinely members of the extension because they have feathers. So these are typically errors that you are predisposed to make in composing an analytic definition. Notice that it is the statement of the differentia or intention that is very critical in producing an analytic definition. This first thing you should guard against in constructing a definition is either producing too broad or too narrow statement of the definition. In order for us to become more intelligent, wise, and smart in composing an analytic definition, we should consider the important rules. So, what are they? So, let us recap some of the rules that can guide you in composing a good analytic definition. These rules are easy to follow and apply. As a critical thinker, these are the same rules you can use on criticizing your own definition. So, let's proceed for rule number one. A sound definition states a trait or a set of traits, characteristics, or functions that members must possess. The trait need not be an essential trait that is necessary and sufficient conditions for membership. If this were the requirement, it would narrowly limit concept formation in ordinary language. The concept of family resemblance of traits and characteristics will do for most of our ordinary concepts. Your guide is it should not be too broad to include non-members and of course not too narrow to exclude genuine members. For rule number two, definitions must not be circular. You are prone to do this if you are using a synonym to define a term like an elegant is a foreigner. Uh -uh -uh -uh. Definition by synonym is an approximation of a definition. As such, it gives a rough idea of the use of an unfamiliar term by a familiar one. Some subtle examples of circular definitions are A cause is an event that has an effect, and an effect is an event that has a cause. Another good pair to illustrate the error is Belief is having faith, and faith is having belief. For rule number three, a sound definition must not be stated in the negative when it can be stated in the affirmative. For example, some philosophers define mind as an entity that is neither tangible nor visible. It has no weight, mass, or location. So, what is it? Definitions must state what it is and not what it is not. This is not to say that some concepts cannot be defined except in the negative. Four. Rule number four. A sound definition should not use figurative, obscure, and metaphorical language. 
For instance, love is never having to say you are sorry. The next one, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And of course, the next example, democracy is the best form of government. So the language may be poetic, but it is not an informative. And of course, for rule number five, lastly, avoid defining by synonym or by ostensive definitions. These are incomplete. Once again, these are incomplete as well as misleading techniques. Only people without formal training in composing a definition use these techniques. I know you could give a better analytic definition. And of course, now let's adapt and apply all the tips to compose a good analytic definition. So, what are those? So, let's bear in our mind the admonition of Hakka. The first one, do not define the obscure by means of the obscure. Meaning, don't try to lighten somebody's darkness by providing a lamp without oil in it. Next, use words that your hearers understand or that can be made intelligible to them. Next, clarify the ambiguous by means of the un ambiguous. Next, render the unspecific specific and the vague precise. Next, in a word, let your hearers know what you are talking about. Make it impossible for them to misunderstand you. And of course, last but not the least, circular definition and definitions expressed in metaphorical, negative, or unintelligible words all breaks these rules and should all be avoided. Always remember all of those. And of course, before we end our group report in our philosophy class, I want you to challenge to observe and apply all the learnings and knowledge you have gained and got in these sessions. So, the concept that we will use is the analytic definition. So, for its definition, the answer is analytic definition itself. For its definitions that is divided into two, the genus is, is the type of definitions that makes use of three categories, definium, definions, and denotata are the differentia. And of course, for its denotata, those are the definitions of mammal and verb above are the examples of analytic definitions. I hope you have a great experience for learning all of this. Bye!